friend and greet each, greet each other today.
Ukrainians, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would put mercy in the hearts of the Russians. We ask that you do a miracle. We ask that you teach us how to pray, Lord, right now for our world, that you teach us how to pray for the Ukrainians. We ask, Lord, that you would protect all of them, Lord. We ask, Lord, that there would be no casualties. Help us to pray wild prayers, Lord, that we know that you can answer because nothing is impossible for you. We even ask, Lord, that the bombs, that the artillery wouldn't even work, that it would just jam, and that there would be peace. We thank you, God, for taking all fear away, all fear away among the nations. We ask, Lord, for your almighty peace to hover over the world, and we thank you for it hovering over us. Lord, any fears that we have, we, we gave them to you now, Lord. We ask that you would hover over us and let us know that in all the anxiety, that you're washing it away as we are worshiping and turning our eyes upon you, Lord. And we thank you that we get to worship you here right now. Thank you so much for giving us this moment of freedom that we can worship you. And we want to lay everything right now at your feet so we can see your face. In Jesus' name. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears. Let 
the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and see. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it my fears were drowned in perfect love you rescued me so i could stand dancing i am a child of god and i'm no longer a slave to fear to be here today. I'm Pastor Jim Fennessy. I'm an assistant at Redeemer Lutheran Church. Do you realize the quality of the music you have here? It is a blessing to worship the Lord together. And thank you, team. Thank you, Melody. Thank you for sharing all of your talents and skills. I know I'm supposed to say something different. I don't know what it is because I'm new. But I do believe I say welcome. Welcome in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe you, I, I should also ask you to share the peace of the Lord together because there is no fear. There is no fear. We are saved by the power and blood of Jesus. So share that peace with one another now, please. I know you're already welcome, but share the peace of the Lord. Yes, for freedom, Christ has set us free, hasn't he? Hasn't he? Are there any announcements that you would like to share? I'm not sure what I should share, but perhaps you do. I actually have one. Okay. Um, for all the boys and girls that are in this room, we're going to be doing a really fun um, video, and we're going to be starting um, practicing on that today after church. And so we'd love for you to all join us. If you will, let us rise and share together our confession of faith, our confession and absolution, as the Lord has called us. If you, we know we've sinned, so we must confess that to the Lord. Let us share that together. God makes no distinction between us. We are all sinners. We are all children of God. We are all precious to God. And we are all saved by God. Because God is so impartial, let us confess our common humanity to the one who is generous with his grace to all. You meet us here, God of faithfulness, in the wilderness of our complacent and self-centered ways. Sometimes we are treat the strangers who walk among us with fear and doubt. We often afflict our anger on those who care about us the most. We impose hard words on those who need to hear most and grace their hearts. So now we bring our hearts to you, generous God, setting them down before you in hopes that 
you will mend them. As you hear our faltering words, we pray you would answer us with your forgiving love. And as you forgive us, may we go forth be generous with our lives towards others, even as the one who is Lord of all, Jesus Christ, has been so generous to us. Take a moment of silence now for personal reflection and confession, and we'll continue in a moment. continue. The good news, the good news is that there is no mistake for which we cannot be pardoned. There is no wilderness where God cannot lead us to still waters. Thanks be to God that we are sheltered in his gracious mercy and hope. Thanks be to God that we are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I've got a couple of scripture readings for you today. One of them comes from Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 8. And it reads like this. Paul has been writing in Romans 9 and 10, making a comment about the Israelites who have not chosen to believe. They look elsewhere, and he says this, what does it say? It says, the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. For with the heart one believes, and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. That there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. And now I'd like to share Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory because it has been delivered to me. It'll be yours. And I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only should you serve. So he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, 
and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us sing together House of Miracles. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. There's resurrection power. Your blood runs through. Your kingdom triumphs over Even the coldest grave We sing come alive in the name of Jesus Come alive in the name of Jesus This is a house of miracles We bring everything to the feet of Jesus everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Sing, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. I still believe you're moving, I still believe you're speaking, God I believe you're working, all things were good, I fix my eyes on heaven, God I receive your vision, God I believe you're working, all things were good, please sing come alive in the name of Jesus, come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the need of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. is a house of miracles. And why? Because Jesus is here. Yes. Jesus is here among us. Children, you're excused to kids' church. I pray that the Lord bless you richly as you go and enjoy that time together. And thank you again, music team. Thank you. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied to you from God our Father 
and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Can we pray, please? please? Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the grace, for the mercy, and the peace that you bestow on us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son, whom you gave for us. I pray, Lord, that as we look at this passage today in Romans and in Luke, that your words would speak clearly to our hearts and that my words would fade into the background if they're worthless because only you have the power over sin and death. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I'd like to pull together those two passages that we read earlier, Romans 10 and Luke 4. In Romans 10, we hear of what we must do to be saved. In Luke 4, we see Jesus, the one in whom we put our trust, the one who saves, stopping Satan in his tracks as he tempted Jesus to sin and to derail God's plan of salvation. Now, most of us know certain parts of Romans by heart, even if you've never really studied it and tried to memorize it. Now, there's four major themes on the road to salvation that are shared in the book of Romans. Let me share those with you. The first theme is Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's not a surprise to us. We wake up in the morning and we know that we're not perfect. At least I do. (laughs) The second theme is Romans 6.23, where it says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The third theme that we see is listed in Romans 5.8, where it says God, I love this word that begins there, but... Instead of all the stuff, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then the fourth theme we see is in Romans 10, 9 through 10, which we, I read just a moment ago. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, with that as a backdrop, let me ask you this very simple theological quiz. There's there's four possible options, multiple choice. Here's a question. How good do you and I have to be to get into heaven? Okay, uh, first option is A, pretty good. The second option is B, really good. The third option is Better than Uncle Joe or Aunt Snazzy or the people down the street. Or D, perfect. Well, unsurprisingly, I think in this congregation, the answer is D. You have to be perfect. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to be with our Lord and Savior through eternity, you have to be perfect. Now, I don't mean sort of perfect, mostly perfect, 80% perfect. You know, being 80% perfect is like being 80% pregnant. I've got a daughter and a daughter-in-law that are both pregnant right now. They didn't say, guess what, I'm almost pregnant. I'm partly pregnant. They are pregnant, and they're excited, as we are. But you're pregnant or you're not. You're perfect or you're not. Now, the kicker in this is I think that 99% or some variation of that across the world believes it really is A or B or C. Most people, if you talk to them, they say A. I've talked to them recently, and that is you've got to be pretty good. You've got to be pretty good. If I'm pretty good on the scale of relative goodness, surely, surely I'll go to heaven. Right? 
I mean, God loves us. However, it says in the word that God demands perfection. The Apostle Peter put it like this in his book, 1 Peter chapter 1. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy. Be holy, y'all, because he is holy. Now that's a pretty shocking thought to a lot of people. Because we live in an imperfect world, we really don't know what perfection looks like. It's hard to grasp. Do you have to be perfect to go to heaven? Most will say yes. But they don't really get what it means. See, God is perfect. And he will not allow imperfect people to join him in heaven. You've got to be perfect from the moment of birth, even before that. Psalm 51 tells us that. For I was, when I was conceived in my mother's womb, I was sinful. And you've got to be perfect through your life. And you've got to be perfect unto death. It's quite impossible. God's standard, though, is absolute perfection. 100% of the time. That means, I think, we have two options. If we want to go to heaven. One is, you have to be perfect. So is it possible to be saved by following the law of God? Well, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, it indicates that there is. We can, but there's a catch. We can't do it. We just can't do it. We want to do it. We want to keep it perfectly. We want to keep it in word and deed. But from the moment we're born to the moment we die, we can't say God, it's like, oh, I made that mistake. Can I get one redo? How many redos will we need? Okay, the second option, if you want to go to heaven, is you've got to find somebody who will take your place, who is perfect. That is the reason Jesus was born. The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 4, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, to redeem those, us, who live under the law, so that we might be adopted into the family of God through faith in Jesus. That is it. That is the key, faith in Jesus. Now, when you look at Jesus, when he was 12 years old, his parents had taken the family to Jerusalem for the Passover, and he was left behind by mistake. When his parents found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions, they scolded him because they had been very worried. For three days, he'd been missing. He responded, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Jesus knew he had a mission. His father had sent him into the world for a purpose. That purpose was to redeem us sinners by transferring his holiness, his perfection, to all who put their trust in him. While he takes our broken commandments to the cross. Now, at his baptism in the Jordan River, the, John the Baptist proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, every Jewish person knew that every day a lamb was the sacrificial victim in the Jerusalem temple for the forgiveness of sins. But there John says, there's the one, the Lamb of God. Every Jew remembered how the blood of the lamb was smeared on the door frames of the homes of their ancestors in Egypt to set people free from slavery. And since the fall of Adam and Eve, at the beginning of time, every human being has been destined to die. And Satan loves to hold us in the fear of death. That song was awesome. Satan promises false theologies to make us think that we we have control.
that we can be our own God. Some theologies state that there is no God, so just don't worry. I've talked to people who say, you know what, at the end of time, all I can say is that was a good ride. Other theologies tell us that we can do the best we can because we're not perfect. It's got to be okay with God, right? Still other theologies tell us that we shouldn't worry because all religions, everything, is a pathway to heaven. And yet other theologies simply state that you have to earn heaven by keeping a set of rules yourself. You see, Satan knows that we human beings cannot keep the commandments perfectly. And so he wants us to put our faith in loopholes and ideas that are contrary to God. After Jesus was empowered for ministry, the first thing the Holy Spirit did was lead him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now the desert, the desert in the Bible, is kind of a double symbol. First, it means a place of encounter with God, like Moses had. Second, it's a place of testing, like the Israelites were for 40 years. Jesus was tested in the wilderness. And in the wilderness temptations, I see a replay from the beginning of time, from Genesis 2, in the battle between the fallen angel and two perfect humans with free will who walked in the cool of the garden with God. But this time, it was a battle with the new Adam in the Judean wilderness. The new Adam was Jesus. And we know that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was physically and emotionally drained. Well, in this battle, the entire universe was at stake in the drama unfolding in that wilderness. God had made Adam and Eve trustees of part of God's creation. You ever think of this like this? The earth is part of God's creation. Because of their disobedience, though, they handed the title deed, if you will, over to Satan. Satan became the god of this world. And in the wilderness, the second Adam, Jesus, faces off with the same enemy that had been there at the beginning. Well, the first temptation in the wilderness challenged Jesus' hunger. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread and eat. The temptation was to lure Jesus to use his divine power. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that God speaks. Now Jesus was human, fully human and fully God. But as a second Adam, a man, Jesus, must defeat Satan's temptations by being perfect. Now the second temptation finds Jesus standing on the highest point of the temple. Satan is tempting Jesus to avoid death. Jump! Jump! Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship the Lord. In other words, Satan, you know who I am. I am God in human flesh and in bone. The third temptation, Satan shows Jesus the kingdoms of the world and offers their power and their glory. Satan would hand over to Jesus the kingdom that he had taken from Adam and Eve. If Jesus would only do one thing, bow down and worship him. Satan's saying, you know what? You can avoid the cross. You don't have to die. Take your kingship now, Jesus said. Do not put the Lord, your God, to the test. Now, in all three of those cases, Jesus did not sin. He did what every human being should do, but can't. 
It is why James, the brother of, of Jesus, wrote this practical advice in his book. He says, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, After 40 days in the wilderness and after Satan had tempted Jesus, the angels came and ministered to him. See, Adam was called to exercise his dominion on the earth. The nation Israel was called to do the same. Adam failed in the garden. Israel failed in the wilderness. Jesus succeeded in defeating Satan's temptations in the wilderness and on the cross. Thus, the writer of Hebrews can write this. We have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, yet he was without sin. That's amazing. After three years of healing people from their illnesses, after healing the blind, after healing those with leprosy, Jesus told his disciples that the upcoming Passover in Jerusalem would be different. He told them that he would be betrayed into the hands of the political authorities. They would kill him. And after three days, he would rise from the dead. Jesus told him this three different times, that the cross was his destiny. So when Paul, after Jesus died and rose again, wrote Romans, and especially Romans 10, 9, he knew how revolutionary those words were in that first century. See, in the Roman Empire, if a man stood up in a crowd and shouted, Jesus is Lord. He could be stoned to death. In those days, declaring anyone Lord but Caesar was considered treason. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. These words could not be simpler or plainer or clearer. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. See, God has, done every, God has done everything necessary for you and me to be reconciled with him and to live eternally in heaven in his presence, cleaned and purified by the blood of Jesus. He sent his son who died on the cross and rose from the dead. That's good news. God has made salvation simple. We make it complex so that people who are lost can be saved. He made it simple, so that people who are guilty can know they are forgiven. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this word. I do pray that your spirit would pierce our hearts and our minds with its truth as we continue our worship of you today. If you would, please rise as we share together our confession of faith in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. God, light of life, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. Third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. An apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, 
and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we receive the offerings. together as we share our prayers to the Lord. O Lord Most High, be the dwelling place of your people. For the sake of Jesus, who suffered temptation and death for our redemption, be our refuge. Preserve us from every evil and plague and strengthen us in faith so that we might be satisfied with your salvation. Lord, in the midst of this life, we are beset by many temptations. Give us strength, Lord, through the Spirit to fix our eyes on Jesus, who bore temptation for us and resisted to the point of death. Bring us through the evils of this fallen world to dwell with you forever. 
Lord, you bestow your riches on all who call upon you. I pray, Lord, that you would bless parents with all wisdom as they teach their children your ways. That all in every household would confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord. Lord, we, we recognize that you govern the kingdoms of this world according to your holy and gracious will. And yet, Lord, we don't understand what we're seeing between Russia and Ukraine and the various nations surrounding Ukraine. Lord, I pray that your wisdom and your power and your glory would overshadow and give wisdom and solution to that conflict. Lord, I, I echo what Melody prayed earlier. Jam the guns. Jam the guns and stop it. We know nothing is impossible for you, and yet you also say, at the right time. So Lord, I simply pray that we would be on our knees, because this is a time for us to be on our knees praying for solution, praying for peace, praying for protection. Lord, I do pray that you would protect all the authorities, all those elected officials in our country, in our state, in our city, in our county, that they would be free from every temptation, that they would look to you And Lord, we also pray for those who are ill, those who need healing, those who need restoration. Lord, we lift up to you Hans and Helene and Marilyn and Mike and Bernadette and Deacon John and Carmen and Melanie. And for all those too, Lord, that are not listed, but we pray for in our hearts now. Father, we pray that you'd be with them in their trouble. Rescue them according to your gracious will. And Lord, for those who can't be here physically, we think of BJ and Lenny and Liz and Irene. God, bless them where they are. May your spirit of peace and of compassion be with them. Lord, we know that everyone who believes in Jesus as Lord will not be put to shame. So unite your people, Lord, with your word and free us over disagreement, over your truth. As we come together to share the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, knit us together in the bond of peace. Lord, we thank you we thank you for the gift of music. We thank you for the gift of this building and this church. May Emmanuel be an outreach to this world around them. But may they be a beacon of light to a lost and dying and confused world that looks to everything except Jesus Christ. So Lord, we, together we, we, we want to share the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
our Lord Jesus Christ on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he'd broken it, give thanks. He gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Amen. The table is now ready. and with great joy living and walking with your Lord and Savior Jesus until you shall visit the same again. God. 
garments white in the blood of Calvary's land. Jesus paid it all, all to him I died my soul to save my lips just to repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow The crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus. Would you stand as we sing, please? What a fashion, what a joy divine. Oh. 
dread What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near Leaning on the everlasting arms Christian with us and have a great week. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Be to God.